Let's jump right into the conversation with Dr. Kalu Idika Kalu, who is a former Minister of Finances, joins us virtually this morning. Good morning, sir, and thank you so much for your time today. Can you hear me, sir? Dr. Kalu, can you hear me, sir? Well, we'll certainly be uh, hearing him any moment from now, but just so you don't, you know, uh, those who will be wondering, you know, who is Dr. Kalu? Well, Dr. Kalu was the country's uh, Minister of Finance at different times during military and civilian regimes in this country. He's a renowned economist. He's also uh, been he's a renowned you know, public servant. And he's widely regarded for his expertise in economic policies that has had a, a notable career both within and outside Nigeria. And a number of things can do. By the way, he's also been uh, minister of, besides being minister of finance, he's also been at various times minister of national planning and minister of transport in the country. We'll be hearing a little more from him um, in a short while. By the way, to also let you know that he is well. Dr. Kalu, can you hear me now, sir? Well, I can hear you. It's a little bit too loud. Okay. We'll, we'll adjust we'll that. We'll just turn it down. Yeah, we'll, we'll adjust that right now, sir. So you don't... We'll, we'll adjust that. Thank you, sir. Well, perhaps, you know, the first uh, thing we want to ask you is, uh, uh, there are those who have been calling for, I mean, thankfully you're also, you know, part of the Patriots. There are those who have been wondering, how significant is the place of a new constitution to national or economic development from your experience as a public servant how significant is that well it is very significant i mean if um, the constitutional changes are meant to ensure that the the full economy is is functioning admin, administratively in terms of uh, sharing of the burden of security, uh, resource mobilization, uh, deployment of uh, people across the large areas of this country. So, so it should always be assumed that a clamor for a change in constitution, like uh, the patriots and other stakeholders have been pushing for, uh, it just stands to reason that there is a direct, direct relationship. Mm. Well, there are those who also wonder <coughs> in the line of whether or not it is significant that sometimes the problem is not in the laws, but in the operators of the laws. The, an instance given frequently is that the constitution as we have it now is very clear on the functions of the local government systems and the functions of the common purse of the uh, state governors and the local government administrations. But there are those who believe that even despite that constitutional provision, the governors have continually eroded on the finances meant for the local government, irrespective of that constitutional provision. So sometimes they say it's not a function of who of the laws or the constitution, but the people who are operating them. What's your take on that? Well, I agree to a very large extent with that. Uh, in a way, you can say this is a chicken and egg uh, problem once again. The leadership, obviously, is paramount. Uh, you cannot tailor made a structure for all time or for all circumstances. So that's where it's so proper that those who assume leadership, the system by which they get there, the system by which we uh, monitor them and um, oversee, whether through the judiciary or the legislature, and of course, most importantly, by the direct, uh, you know, the people themselves directly, who are the, ultimately the, uh, the, the sovereignty or who hold the sovereignty of the realm. Yes, the structure is important. The structure provides, hopefully, a, a guideline that can stand for some time, so you don't have to be tinkering with it every, every other time. But there's no question that the tone of what happens thereafter depends on how that structure truly reflects 
the ownership of the people, their aspirations, and uh, the kind of hopes and dreams that they have. That is why the constitution is so significant. But I also agree that whatever you fashion, the quality of those who go through the system to implement, of course, is very, very significant. So the two issues, right, it's not a, a zero-sum sort of thing. There's a direct relationship. One contributes to the other, and we should not try to discuss the two aspects in isolation. They have to be taken up uh, in tandem. So the, the, two, the two angles to these are quite correct, you know. Well, there is also the question of accountability, Dr. Kalu. There are those who wonder whether or Thank not, you. in spite of the, the uh, provisions of the Constitution about um, accountability and all those things, it would seem like it's either not significant enough or not existent enough, or the structures are not strong enough to take on the <laughs> individuals who are, who are being unaccountable. So in terms of constitutional review and everything, uh, aside, uh, speak first of all to the accountability element. Do we have a system, even laws, that hold governments at various levels, federal, state, or local, to account, particularly in the area of, uh, of our development and all of it that they hold in on behalf of the nation? Well, this is a very critical question. Uh, over so many occasions in the past, I've had to look at the issue, the strange issue that uh, we copied our system, primarily from the United States system. The United States system has explicitly an office of accounting. Well, it works in the US. The Americans would not say it's absolutely perfect, but the structure is there. With all the things we borrowed from their constitution, we seem to have left that out. Uh, I'm not suggesting, of course, that we didn't institute others. We've set up all kinds of uh, 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 instrumentalities, uh, uh, all kinds of committees, provisions, legal uh, structures to make sure that there's accountability from the local government to the state to the federal. But I think any, any observer, any honest observer, will go along with your question that uh, it, uh, it begs the question whether, in fact, we have uh, oversight, we have accountability, we have uh, causes and effect, we have uh, consequences for violating uh, the rules even the rudimentary ones that we have. So once again, we are talking about a chicken and egg issue, whether it is the, the, the kind of leadership that gets to be subjected to the accounting system or the fact that the accounting system itself is not strong enough or explicit enough or legally strong enough uh, to hold people to check. So again, there are two sides to the question and they should be discussed together. This is a very major question. I think the citizenry at every level has been asking these questions. How do we get so much money uh, to seep out of the system? How do we get so many stories to seem sort of die the minute they hear the headlines? How do we get a situation where nobody seems to have any memory for what has gone wrong and they need to always go back and make sure that the citizen who will be, be called upon to sacrifice, pay tax, who are entitled by the endowment of their resources, continually get shortchanged because people are not being uh, monitored to make sure that what is budgeted reflects what is needed and what is spent uh, can be seen as what has been put into the projects for which they have been implemented. You can go through so many levels of this issue. So like every other issue, we, we, we need to focus on this problem. Mm. So from what you have said now, does that suggest that we have individuals who are stronger than institutions? Well, this happens in every system, obviously. Uh, some leaders are more listening. Some leaders have their own moral, personal moral code. Some leaders have their own sense of uh, uh, responsibility to their electorate. Some leaders have a different sense of a sense of continuity where you can come back and uh, face the tune when people come and assess how you function. So, you know, for obvious reasons, uh, the quality of the leadership and all these other aspects that I've just uh, listed 
uh, will the limit the extent to which that sense of accounting becomes a very important uh, uh, checks uh, 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 part of the checks and balances that should be in the system. Mm -hmm. So this is something just as important as the constitution, as the legal structure, as the uh, oversight uh, structures at the National Assembly, the various party structures, for instance, even within the political parties. So all these other institutions are meant to ameliorate and more or less um, remove those that are purely arising from uh, differential personalities in terms of their strength of character, their moral code, I said, their own personal moral uh, principles, uh, their sense of accountability, whether in the home or in the church or in other areas. When you get such people who are now faced with uh, maybe weighty issues of uh, the state in terms of both quantum and uh, quality, uh, they, they bring their different personalities to bear and then we have this sense of impunity, continuing impunity and a sense of not listening, which of course the electorate uh, gets a hang of and cannot be very happy about it. This happens every time. So again, whatever one says there, it's all a matter of uh, looking back and see how it applies to previous administration. But we're supposed to be learning from our past. So we don't expect to be coming back to the same issue over and over and over again. And, and it's, a, it's a sad one because I, I, mean, I imagine that you sometimes look back and wonder how did we get here. So now with all of these that you've said, you've raised issues around accountability, you've raised issues around uh, you know, um, impunity, you've raised issues around individuals tending to be stronger than institutions. How does a new constitution address these issues? Well, the way a new constitution addresses these issues, of course, is um, in various ways. Uh, first of all, you know, our system of government, we are not disputing the federal structure. We are not disputing the, uh, the, the bicameral structure, except perhaps in terms of how it's too expensive for our resources at times. What we are disputing is how the, the institution, the constitution itself, will reflect the powers, the strengths, if you like, the responsibilities, the fiscal and monetary uh, responsibilities, particularly the fiscal, let's leave out the monetary for a minute, the fiscal responsibilities. Uh, so through the constitution, you can explicitly review this and uh, use the benefit of hindsight and present circumstances to now redraw it. It is absolutely the right of the people. This issue that arises where we begin to have a pro and con, those who want it reviewed, those who want it reduced, this should not arise. It's absolutely the right of the citizens or their representatives. When they feel there's some measure of a divergence, distortion, or getting off the rails, if you like, they have every right to say, let's sit down and review these things. Uh, if we do it properly, we should not be doing it too often, and we should not be doing it in a wholesale fashion, like you are throwing out the whole uh, baby with the bathwater. You're just selecting those areas that have not been functioning as they should in the interest of the peace and stability and orderly development of the, of the country. Those, 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 should, those should be, over time, become less and less. The American Constitution, they've had over uh, 13 major amendments over hundreds of years. That is the kind of thing we are talking about. Again, that goes back to the sheer quality of the electoral process, the political pro uh, party process. In fact, it goes back to all the mores of society, the education, the cultural values, the, uh, um, if you like, the... Uh, the way people are brought up in various institutions, they bring this to bear when they get positions in power and they can see where their responsibilities spring from and where their, their alliance should be. The, 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 the issue of uh, accounting to the people who elected them, the issue of uh, strict stewardship of the funds that have been, scarce funds that have been allocated to carry out definite functions. And we can see how we have uh, strayed away. Uh, during our own time, I might say, I was not really the kind of 
the civic politician, we came in under military and so on and so forth. So you can say things are much more specific. But there is no question that uh, you, you, you had a duty to follow the principles, the, the general orders of the civil service, and so on and so forth. And there was a structure in place. Uh, we've set up uh, uh, committees to review salaries and, and, uh, and all these things. Those are some of the areas I find are a clear aberration from what we work with because we didn't have such things. These were constituted and properly uh, looked at. We just didn't come around taking uh, ratios and purposes from other realms that are quite distinct from your own. And you end up uh, creating a situation that is somewhat uh, top heavy for the resource quantity and the growth of, that, of those resources. So these are some of the areas that clearly need to be reviewed. The question of the responsibility to a cabinet, uh, however constituted, is a cabinet. They make a decision based on their perception of the priorities of the society. These days we hear so much about, uh, uh, I don't know, what the people that are able to attract to their constituency, so-called constituency projects. In my humble opinion, those are the issues that we really need to examine very thoroughly. We, we don't need people uh, telling us they attracted this, they attracted that. We need governance at every level that can correctly identify the priorities of their, of their immediate constituencies, the local government, the state government, of course, the overall federal government, pick the priorities, implement them as to the letter, uh, to the letter and not this uh, tendency to let uh, unfinished projects sort of uh, scatter the entire landscape. So it is the responsibility of the cabinet to set priorities through studied discussions and debate, open debate in which decision centers can uh, be involved with open hearings and so on and so forth. So those are some of the elements that will improve the working of the constitution. And I think, as I said, if the people feel that we have strayed too far in implementing the constitution, then we need to review it and find out the reasons why we have done that. Okay. It should be a very healthy periodic Hopefully not too often, but it's certainly a responsibility of all arms of government. The, the people, the legislative, the executive, and of course the judiciary. Mm. Well, I mean, I, I, there are so many issues to raise from the questions. Uh, from, so many questions come to me from the issues that you have raised. But let me quickly piggyback on one of them, which you just talked about now, which is the issue of constituency projects. Uh, it, what, what exactly do you think of that idea? There are those who are wondering, well, the legislators, for instance, are saying, look, this is the one way that people will know that they are the ones that, you know, did this for their community. What's your take on, on that idea of constituency projects since this Fourth Republic began? Well, the, I, the, the, the idea itself may seem quite uh, normal and nothing abhorrent, but the way it's been handled, the way the decisions are taken, the way in the end you see the stacking of the priorities for a whole community. There again, we're talking about strong, strong leadership. It goes again to strong representation, but by the time you bring it to a collective cabinet level decision, all these things will be sort of uh, ironed out. Okay. And the people have a right to feel that those who had these cabinets at all levels, state, uh, local, federal, are taking cognizance of the overall priorities. The overall priorities tell you about what the community needs, what the community can do with reference to the resources available, because the resources, resources are not available for all the projects as okay. uh, lo laudable as they may be. And the assurance that once you've you've taken some priorities because of how it keys into the overall development of the specific area. The next time you pick another, and the, 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 the uh, kudos, if you like, goes to the leadership, to the cabinet, and not necessarily to any particular individual. But in the course of getting these priorities, of course, the individual brings to bear their ability to perceive what the needs, what the major needs of the various communities are. That's what the debates are for. That's what the open hearings are for. But it should not be where you are trying to show off that you are so strong, you grab most of the budget for your own community and somebody else is not able to do so for all kinds of reasons. So <laughs> they, are, they are not bad ideas in themselves, but the way 
we have uh, operated them. Particularly okay. the way we have, we have tried to now uh, allocate fiscally the resources to implement these projects leaves a whole lot to be desired. That's what I'm saying. That, that so I think that yeah, the apologies. whole idea needs a review. Mm. Well, um, w perhaps one of the issues is that of impact. And um, yes. the, the, idea, the, the things that affected mo people the most, that's impacted people's lives the most these times is the cost of living. And it goes to the policies of government, the fiscal policies, the monetary policies and all. Uh, of course, you are not unaware of the new rates uh, from the CBN. Um, what exactly do you think is going on? The, it seems like the MPC just uh, has seen a ladder and it's just climbing. What's your take on it? How functional is it? How productive is it? And how futuristic is it? How sustainable is it on the pockets of Nigeria? Well, once again, you know, just about any major question is so critical to the present and future, if you like, of our fortunes. Now, we've uh, hyped these uh, monetary policy committees and so on. We are, we are hyping them uh, with cognizance to how these are operating in London or in, in New York and uh, what have you. But you know that the, the system depends on the structure we have in place. The financial system, the spread of the financial system, the coverage of that system to all nooks and crannies of our large country. 200 million plus people in villages and small towns, in localities, small towns, cities, and so on and so forth. So whatever rates you adjust may seem fine, and I'm not suggesting they are not fine. I, I saw the broad objectives to tighten money, to curb inflation, perhaps to also reduce undue uh, pressure on the exchange rate. Already, uh, early indications suggest that far from the exchange rate improving, uh, it's as even in most uh, of the now reduced market sources, even increased the, uh, the Naira uh, dollar rate in terms of uh, the uh, sort of uh, depreciation of the Naira with respect to, say, the dollar. So, and some of these uh, changes that may seem counterintuitive, deriving from the otherwise proper tes properly tested theory, uh, goes to show how, how much coverage, how much do, does the interest rate, how much does the exchange rate actually reflect the cubicles of demand. Some of them are just not really interconnected because of the sheer uh, uh, structure of our market. The, 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 uh, the structure is not evenly connected for all kinds of reasons. Communications, transport, uh, direct uh, supervision, and so on and so forth. In fact, just even uh, official representation of branches of banks and so on and so forth. So whatever we do at the monetary policy thing, we must also adjust with respect to what effectiveness it will have on the entire system. I know this sounds very, very complicated, but at that level, this is the work that the CBN and the monetary authorities should continually be doing. This is part of the monitoring of the banks by the, uh, by the central monetary authorities to see how, if you like, the penetration of uh, monetary uh, uh, instruments into the entire system, into agricultural areas, into um, manufacturing hubs, into the transport system, just about every sector of the economy. There has to be that uh, penetration so that you have a, a little bit of more assurance that whatever minute changes that you make on the interest rate, you can almost correctly uh, rate how it will impact on the real sectors okay. and the financial sectors. All right. Well, so many questions to ask you, and I think Kayla has some for you as well. Dr. Kalu, uh, you know, listening to, to some of the things that you said right now, you know, I want to be able to get your thoughts really as former Minister of Finance on, you know, what this government is doing. And, and let me be able to explain that properly. We're looking at a situation where we have a rising inflation, we have rising unemployment, 
Uh, and then we're seeing a standard of living that is dropping constantly. As Minister of, former Minister of Finance, looking at the policies of the Tinubu administration right now, we keep hearing them talk about how these are the hard choices that have to be made while we get ready for a better future. Are these the policies to get Nigerians into this better future? Is there something good coming in the future, in your view? Or are we playing a game that could actually backfire? Not playing a game. Uh, the situation is, is too dangerous. The situation is... Yes, I, I hope you can hear me. Can you hear I me? I can hear you now, yes. Okay, you can hear me now. Yes, indeed. I said, I hope this is more than a game. Or, in fact, I, I think we are in such a serious situation, we should not even talk in terms of a game. We've had to consider so many policies over the last 40 years. A lot of those policies, well, as you say, I was in finance twice. Uh, by the time I came back the second time into finance in the early 90s, we were still grappling with some of those uh, uh, policies that we tried to enunciate in the mid-80s, or you can even say in the early 80s, since I returned from my stint at the World Bank. So one has had a fair uh, acquaintance with the genesis of some of the things we're still talking about. It could not be a game. It is, it is absolutely important that we know that the only basis for judging our policies in any static or dynamic sense is the import the direct impact of these policies on the general living of our people. People in agriculture, people in manufacturing, people in mining, people in the important oil and gas sectors, people in the arts, people in the infrastructures, the entire economy. So it cannot be a game. So um, policies have to be taken very seriously. Uh, I have had occasion to address some of these issues. I don't want to be raising fresh is issues with every question, but let's just go back to the subsidy issue. Well, obviously, as I said over and over again, I wrote about this back in the 80s. You see, if sub subsidies were uh, 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 not liable to abuse, liable to overuse, and li liable to uh, being non-cost effective by the sham quantum of how it impacts on the budget and on the uh, efficiency in the resource allocation, nobody will be using it. But as I also said, nothing is inherently negative about the introduction of subsidies. This is still happening in Russia, in America, in Argentina, in France, and so on and so forth. Again, it goes to the question of economic leadership. The leadership has to be uh, those who are easily persuaded about how they can put together a whole amalgam of these instrumentalities that will address the current structure of the economy and impact positively on changing it to a better place. So um, we should not just say uh, we don't know where we are going. Those in charge should know where we are going. And they should be constantly reviewing. We just talked about whether that constancy should include the constitution or it's just really a question of leadership or number of ministers, number of committees, and so on and so forth, uh, to get away from direct instruments like what is happening to the exchange rate or interest rate. So I think that uh, we are in constant flux. Uh, uh, one introduced the notion of that dynamic flux in policy change. And we talked about a term that we introduced in Korea in the mid-70s when the oil price hit Korea. That's how the whole idea of structural adjustment policies, there's nothing else to demean it. There's nothing sacrosanct or static about the contents or the concept of that structural change to reflect new changes in priorities, new changes in uh, competitiveness for the economy. When you are being faced with different uh, uh, terms of trade and external uh, conditions and domestic factors. So we have to continue to review these policies. My impression was, of course, was that because of the sheer number of areas we needed to look at, this could be one way of justifying a fairly large cabinet. So you are, in fact, getting people to hone in on particular areas, such as having about 12 or 15, and uh, uh, lumbering them with uh, mm. sub-areas within the same ministry. But you can also overdo I mean, that. We can also overdo that. I mean, Dr. Kalu, you know, yes. while, while, while we're talking about 
you know, everything that's going on with Nigeria's yeah. economy. Yeah. For many people, especially people from my generation, mm -hmm. all we can see is that there's excessive spending in governance. If you can mm -hmm. cut that down, you know, you can use money for other things, you know, that could mm. help us get to where we are. And, and for many people who are looking at this administration right now, it mm. does feel like, you know, it, it feels like they're tossing, they're trying out things, you know. It doesn't feel like we're actually moving towards something. It, it, they, they say we are, but it doesn't feel like we are. And I'm just talking as someone who's a millennial. This is how we're looking at our country right now and wondering where the future is going to be. My question to you <clears> is, if you, were, if you had the ear, if you had their ear, it, this administration's ear, what would you be telling them to do? Because like you said, the, the only way to measure whatever policies you're, you're proposing is impact. If you had their ear right now, what would you be telling them to do differently that could actually impact us properly and, and make our lives better as Nigerians? Well, I, I don't want to embarrass anybody. I should have their air because I know the major people in this situation. But as I said, I don't want to embarrass anybody. I've made myself available. Uh, and I think a lot of my colleagues at the same level will make their, themselves available because we're all working for the same purpose. I know in the early 80s, traveling to some of our neighbors, even those who've served, uh, twice or three times before in various capacities. Uh, there's a, a system by which you can uh, uh, talk to them and get the benefit of their views privately. At least this should serve to cut down the extent to which, if you like, we stray from the, 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 the path, you know. Now, let me just address the question of too much spending. You see, uh, we, we have... Uh, put in policies that resulted in a much more rapid depreciation of our currency. That rapid depreciation gives right to what uh, I had mentioned earlier today, I think, uh, the whole notion of money illusion. The fact that you are no, 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 so talking about trillions. No, no, I'm coming to your question. So, you see, if the issue is just a numerical quantum of spending, remember, spending, the issue, first and foremost, should be before you spend, you have to rationalize how you spend. If you are spending a lot and the benefits are coming a lot, nobody will quarrel about that. You are spending a lot of, on water, you are spending a lot on roads, you are spending a lot on railways, you are spending a lot on farm support and so on, and you are getting a commensurate return for the spending. So that's what we have to put in context. I'm not saying the general feeling that, oh, money, a lot of money has been spent. But underlying that is the fact that people are not so clear on the effectiveness, the, the marginal contribution of the extra funds that are going to the uh, government treasury, which are now expended on all kinds of things. That is where the question also goes to. I hope you understand the, the definition. It's not just yeah, spending but, so much know, we money. Do, we do have to start wrapping up, uh, Dr. Kalu. We do have yes. to start wrapping up. But before we go, you know, many people actually looking at you, the mm -hmm. structural adjustment program, which, you know, you were very instrumental to uh, creating mm -hmm. back then. You know, many people mm -hmm. say that these are some of the IMF uh, policies that impacted mm -hmm. negatively on our That is a lot of rubbish. Years. That's a lot of rubbish. And it's a, a function of the general... Uh, conventional wisdom, I have tried to explain to you that the name by itself means nothing. The origin was from a society like Korea that depended on importing raw materials from Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Taiwan, and so on to produce their large-scale labor-intensive manufacturers. When they were hit by the quadrupling of the oil price in the early 70s, they had to decide, what do we do? We don't just lie back and die. How do we maneuver out of the constellation of uh, terms of trade issues that are coming up? That's the simple meaning of structural adjustment. The notion that this somehow uh, sapped us and did this really goes to address, as I said, the quality of the content of our conventional wisdom. We did not take enough time to understand that this could have been called budget, this could have been called plan, it didn't have to be called SAP. SAP, structural adjustment, every nation has to face at different levels of income with changes in technology, changes in your trade structure and direction, changes in your, your personnel, your training, and so on. How do you maximize 
the use of this new uh, constellation of new issues to move ahead. But strangely enough, and for 40 years, we have hopelessly failed to understand a very simple concept, which has applied to every other country. How many countries are still talking about SAP, SAP, SAP? They probably have used other names that may be more appropriate if it's the name that matters. So I reject totally this continuing reference to how our problems arose from SAP and so on. The problem arose from our total misunderstanding, and it's about time, 40, 50 years later, we should be moving on. Call it by any other name, the issues are what's happening to our schools, what's happening to our hospitals, what's happening to our farmers, what's happening to our resource allocation at the various levels. Are we mobilizing to address the structures that we produce for our people? Those are the issues that come under the issue of structure. And then you change the structure, mm -hmm. you can call it by any other name. I hope after this program, we I mean, should we do, stop. We do have to, we, <laughs> we we, we, stop we this do have to anchor there, Dr. Right. Kalu. Your thank point you. has been made. And I want to thank Absolutely. you very much for making those points. And talking with us uh, this morning on Sunrise Daily, Dr. Kalu Idika Kalu, former minister. Minister of Finance, thank you again. Thank you very much. We'll go on a commercial break, and when we come back, it will be time for Business Morning on Sunrise Daily. We'll be back again at 10.30. Stay with us. <laughs>